Turning now to your community focus from coastal access to summer violence. There is always a lot of ground to cover with Attorney General Peter Narona. He joins us here once a month on 12 News at 4. Thanks for being here. Hi, Kim. Good to be with you. So let's start with this new lawsuit that was just mm -hmm. filed last week by this group of property owners who owns property on the shore. Yep. They're challenging this new shoreline access law, an update to an existing law. They say essentially it's taking private property without paying for it. Yeah. How are they wrong? Well, look, if you go back to the history of the uh, colonial days in Rhode Island, the public has long had a right to access the shore. And so, look, we're going to make our arguments in a courtroom, you know, not not here respectfully with you, Kim, but we're confident we could defend this important law that uh, makes sure that Rhode Islanders can have access to the shore as they always have. Is there precedent in other states? We're certainly not the only coastal yeah. state. How do other states do this the way we're yeah, doing it now? No, Rhode Island has actually had more public access in most states. You know, for example, in Massachusetts, the light is the right is much more circumscribed. Hmm. Um, but again, we think that this new law is consistent and clarifies the, uh, the people of Rhode Island's right to the shoreline. And so we anticipate a, uh, a defense that uh, we think will hold up in the end. We had Providence Mayor Brett Smiley here on the four the day after the 4th of July, mm. and that proved to be a violent and deadly yeah. 24 hours in the capital city. Have you had any conversations with Colonel Perez about how they're trying to work on the potential spike in violence yeah. that we typically see in the summer? You know, our Urban Violent Crime Initiative uh, is with Providence as, long, as well as with Central Falls and Pawtucket PD and ATF, and, and our work continues. You know, I think if you look um, on balance around the country, look, any death is too many, any shooting is too many. But overall, we do well here in Rhode Island and in Providence, and, I, and it's my hope um, and my expectation that will continue uh, through the summer months this year, too. Speaking of violence in Providence, Isaiah Pinkerton was recently found guilty of murdering Maya Brophy Bierman in Providence back mm -hmm. in 2021. A second man has also been charged in her death, Sean Mann. What's the status of his case? Yeah, so that case will come next. Um, you know, we completed the trial of Mr. Pinkerton successfully, and I'm grateful to the prosecution team and the great detectives from Providence that put that case together. That was a, a, a tough case to put together in the end. It involved ballistic evidence, um, cell site evidence, meaning you know, cell locations from mm -hmm. cellular service, um, and frankly, a lot of circumstantial evidence, but the team did a great job putting it together. I'm really pleased with the outcome. That came together over the course of, what, a couple of years, right? Well, it did, because the firearm was recovered at a later date, and it was through that ballistics te uh, technology and some DNA evidence, they were able to link that gun and that defended Mr. Pinkerton to that shooting of Maya. And so, again, it was great police work. And the reason it took so long was because we needed that additional evidence to develop. Uh, the last time you were here, you said you'd have sort of a better handle and talk more with state police about the investigation, yeah. the criminal investigation, into some conduct by state officials who are on this business trip to Pennsylvania, meeting with the uh, company that's supposed to mm -hmm. redevelop the Cranston Street Armory. Any update on the timeline of their investigation? No, it's ongoing. You know, we're, we are uh, firmly entrenched with them now, and so... There are a number of people we need to interview and take some additional investigatory steps. And when we have more to report to the public, we'll be sure to report back. Have you spoken at all with investigators or the attorney general in Pennsylvania? No, I haven't, you know, because I think I think that case, you know, frankly, there's conduct that occurs in Pennsylvania, um, which only Pennsylvania could address. And then there's conduct down there that might also impact things up here in Rhode Island. Um, but it may be more of a DA issue down there. But either way, the crimes, or if any, that they would be looking at is it would be uh, completely different from what we'd be looking at here jurisdictionally. And just to be clear, that criminal investigation is still ongoing. It hasn't been. Closed. Yeah, it's ongoing. You know, we had a meeting in my office with uh, with the colonel, uh, the lieutenant colonel and the captain of detectives just a couple of weeks ago. And there, we just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. We're sharing information, working together going forward. We'll see where that ends up. And before I let you go, I want to talk to you about a, a suit that you filed against mm -hmm. the solar company Smart Green, alleging deceptive trade practices. Yes. The CEO came and talked to us after mm -hmm. this. He said they've had 2,900 customers go through this tax cycle. They've had four complaints and they were settled. What are we missing? Yeah, what, you're, what he's not sharing with you, Kim, is that there's a lot more misconduct, alleged misconduct than that. And in fact, the more that the CEO of that company speaks to you in the press, the more complaints we get. And so in a sense, he's doing himself a disservice because as people see reporting on that case, uh, they come forward. We've had a number of complaints. Um, I think we had 14 uh, better business complaints against that company alone. And so the bigger picture is that the solar industry is largely uh, unregulated when it comes to sales tactics. And here the sales tax tactics that we allege were quite, were quite um, you know, frankly, uh, concerning. Mm. And so we're going to continue to keep a sharp eye on that industry, including this particular player in it. 
Uh, but uh, consumers in Rhode Island really need to watch out and frankly visit our website for some tips as to how they can protect themselves. So I'll just leave you with one last thing. Sure. I mean, this company, as we, uh, we allege, did not even notify Rhode Islanders of their three-day right to cancel. It may have been in the fine print, but they moved through that fine print so quickly on their handheld devices that as a consumer, you would know that, hey, look, if I get buyer's remorse, if you will, 24 hours or 48 hours later, I have a right under Rhode Island law to cancel that contract. And that was, that was at best, downplayed. Hmm. And that's something to be uh, wary of when you talk to one of these door-to-door -door salespeople. All right, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. Attorney General Peter Nerona, always great having you here at 4. Good to be with you, Kim.